Hello everyone and welcome back to the new color spotlight series. Today's video is going to be a bit more complex than the other episodes as every episode so far has focused on a single pigment and in some cases with burnt sienna even just a particular hue or processing system for a single pigment. But today we are going to be focusing on a specific hue cobalt teal. There are at least two very common pigments that produce this color, but with several other cobalt colors kind of complicating the mix of things, let's first talk about cobalt colors in general, and then we'll move on to cobalt teal. According to handprint.com, cobalt compounds currently produce the widest range of pigments available today, ranging from the most common, which is cobalt blue, to our teals, greens, violets, and even a yellow. Even cerulean blue is a cobalt color, which many people aren't familiar with because of the way that it's named. This group of pigments has a long history, being used all the way back in the Middle Ages and then first modernized in the late 1700s and then made available to artists in the early 1800s. I do have a bit more information for you regarding cobalt colors, specifically regarding the toxicity issue that a lot of people have questions about. And if that's important to you, go ahead and stick around towards the end of the video. I wanted to kind of get along with looking at this color and the mixes. And so I'll talk about that during the painting demo of this video. If you'd like to check out more information about cobalt colors and how they're processed, you can find a link in the description below to handprint.com and an article that explains more about that. Moving on to the star of our episode, the two main pigments that we are going to be looking at today are PG50, which is cobalt titanate oxide, and PB28, which is cobalt aluminate. Let's start with PG50, as this is the most clear-cut pigment for cobalt teal, and then we'll explain the other one. PG50 is a very light, fast, semi-opaque, and granulating pigment that is bright, vibrant, and greenish-blue in color. Unlike the Indian Throne Blue that we looked at last time, this pigment does not have a large drawing shift, and what you see is basically what you're going to get. PB28 is the other pigment used for cobalt teal, but you might recognize that pigment number as it's also the most common version of the standard cobalt blue. I tried to find some information on how it was specifically processed differently than the standard cobalt blue, but I couldn't find anything specific. In general, from the samples that I have seen, the PB28 cobalt teals tend to be on the bluer side of things, while the PG50s have slightly more of a greenish cast to them, with some exceptions in there. On the left here, we have three PB28 cobalt teals for you to look at from Turner, Holbein, and M. Graham. Turner's turquoise is by far the most blue version here. It also is a little bit chalkier and not as granulating as some of the other versions. And Holbein's cobalt turquoise light isn't far behind in terms of the hue. It still has this very bluish color. And as we move into M. Graham's cobalt teal, it's notably much more green in hue and is closer to the other PG50 samples. Sennelier's turquoise green isn't at all a green in my opinion, but rather it's the most blue of the PG50 samples that I have in my collection. Coarse cobalt teal is further leaning towards green, but I also find that it's the one that's the most opaque of the entire bunch. It has a consistency that I don't quite love working with, and I've heard others say that as well. Daniel Smith's is by far the greenest version of this color with notable yellow undertones, and it also has the most granulation. Then I also want to add in a second row of colors here that I can share with you so that we can make some comparisons. Starting now from the right side and moving back across towards the left of the page, I have a second swatch for you of Daniel Smith, and this is the stick version rather than the version that comes out of a tube. Daniel Smith sticks are supposed to be the same as their tube colors, but in this specific case, I found that the stick was very, very hard to rewet. It was very chalky looking. It's not as granulating and it's also not as vibrant. While the other Daniel Smith sticks might be fine for other colors, I would definitely pass on the cobalt teal. Da Vinci's Cobalt Turquoise is a really unique one. It is made from PB36, which you can see a more common sample of to the left of it. PB36 is usually a very green colored turquoise, and you can see that in Daniel Smith's sample here, but Da Vinci's is more of a middle blue hue that matches the other ones that we have been looking at. 
The last two in this row are strictly for comparison's sake as we will not be looking at these hues in depth today, but I wanted to go ahead and show you that cerulean blue. This one is from Windsor and Newton, and it's a much warmer light blue, although it's kind of in the same value range as the cobalt teal. And I also wanted to show you the more standard version of PB28 so that you can see the difference between it and the PB28 cobalt teals. Moving on to color mixing, we are going to be using M. Graham's cobalt teal here in our mixes today. While I realize that PG50 is slightly more common to see in cobalt teal, M. Graham's version seems to have a really reasonable compromise between the blue and the green varieties, and it's also the one that I have on my main palette, which means I have the most experience with it, and I have the most actual physical paint to be able to do these mixes with, rather than working with some smaller samples from the other brands. Like in our End and Throne video, the first row here of mixing features Nickel Azo Yellow, which we will be taking a closer look at later in the series. It was really hard to decide on which yellow I wanted to use for the mixtures for this video, as there are a lot of really notable options. Using a really bright lemon yellow will get you shockingly bright greens, while using a yellow ochre and watering that mixture down will get you a really, really soft, beautiful hue that's great for lichen on trees trees. However, I ended up picking the Nicola as a yellow because it shows a range of very reasonable middle granulating greens that I thought could be useful for in a variety of situations. Next up is Thalo Green Blue Shade once again. Now this admittedly shows the least amount of range in colors as compared to the other rows that we have here, but like I mentioned last week, it's hard to resist mixing beautiful aquas and deeper teals with this combination. Once again, because of the cobalt teal, it will have a much softer and granulating appearance, unlike if you were to do the same mixture with a Thalo or Indian Throne Blue mixed with that Thalo Green. We're going to get a bit moody in our third row with Perlene Green, and oh, Perlene Green, you beautiful, beautiful creature, you. Cobalt Teal brings a softness to this mixture, but balanced with the Perlene Green, you can still get some really deep, cool forest greens as well. Now, I don't have a whole lot to say on the technical side of these mixes, but they were just too beautiful not to share with you. The fourth row is a mixture with pyrrol red. Now pyrrol scarlet or pyrrol orange are technically better mixing complements with the cobalt teal, but I actually prefer the warmth of the grays that are produced with the pyrrol red. On the left there, you're going to see a bunch of muted teals that are pretty dark in value, and as we move further to the right side, we're going to see some granulating warm grays and brick reds. I do regret a little bit not showing off the proper mixing complement here, and I apologize for that. It really just slipped my mind as neither of those colors are on my main mixing palette, but I highly recommend it that you try it for yourself if you have a chance to. Next, we have some lovely purples created from the cobalt teal and a red violet made from PB19. Now, this PB19 is more on the violet version. It's not as pink as a quinacridone rose is, but really anything in this range will do. Just with a touch of the red violet, the teal is going to turn into a very middle, albeit slightly desaturated blue, and with more of the red violet, we get some really stunning purples that, I'm going to say once again, are very soft and delicate looking. Finally, I wanted to show off a more unusual mixture with an earth tone using raw umber. Some shades in this row are a little bit jarring and not super pretty, but we also have some seriously beautiful dark greens and some cool sepia-like browns, and it's definitely worth exploring this combination. At the very bottom of this page, I have some more of those technical mixtures where I show a wet and wet effect where I've wet a box on the page and then put the pigment at the top and see how it flows down. This isn't a highly mobile paint, but I really do like the textures when you add a lot more water, there is a lot more granulation that comes out of it. Next to that is a glaze, first putting down one layer of the paint, waiting for it to dry, and putting down another layer. Then there is a swatch of liftability testing where I put down a fairly thick mixture of this paint and then scraped it up and scraped, scrubbed. <laughs> um, I scrubbed it up with a brush and it was very, very easy to lift. And finally, the last one is that technique that I use so often of softening off the edges by putting down my wet paint on dry paper and then taking a clean brush and fading out the edge to the white of the paper. 
So moving on to our demonstration painting, I would be completely lying to you if I told you that this painting turned out the way I wanted it to. Although my initial gut was to create an icy unicorn for this uh, color and theme, which I'm sure some of you would have actually preferred to this one, I was really excited to start exploring the other options of some other animals as unicorns. And when I was searching for teal animals, I came across this stunning Sumatran blue pit viper, and I just couldn't resist. However, this painting turned out to be an example of what happens when you try a little bit too hard to avoid hyperrealism. I didn't want to get caught up in the very prominent scales on this snake by painting every single individual scale, and I was trying to make him also look more approachable. But ultimately, what happened is that I lost any definition whatsoever, and I took him way far into the land of illustration. Now, illustration's not a bad thing, but as we know from my last video, it's not really my style. I'm still really happy with how this derpy little viper corn, as I'm calling him, turned out, but it's certainly not the best use of cobalt teal, and for that I apologize. I do have a great idea in mind that my patrons helped me out with for the next color spotlight on Quinacridone magenta, and I'll get back on track with that unique unicorn theme while still being slightly realistic. The colors that I used here were cobalt teal and phthalo turquoise for the body of the snake, and I used a light wash of yellow ochre for the belly scales, and I used pyrrole red with a touch of that cobalt teal to neutralize it a bit for the tongue. For the background and the eyes, I used quinacridone gold with a touch of the nickel azo yellow, and the whole piece is finished off with both black and white inks. I did also tint some of the white ink towards the end uh, with a little bit of the cobalt teal to put in some scale texture. So while this painting is kind of playing out, I did promise you a discussion on cobalt toxicity. A long-standing debate surrounding cobalt color centers around this toxicity issue, and I just want to put a huge disclaimer here that I am not an expert in this area. Please don't take my word as absolute truth, but I did do research on this topic because I knew that there would be questions in the comments below if I didn't talk about it. So based on the research that I was able to gather, cobalt colors are considered slightly toxic if inhaled or ingested. So if you are not mulling your own paint or eating your paint, you should be okay. Cobalt colors are not known to cause cancer in experimental studies on rats, but it does affect the late gestation and postnatal development of the pups, according to NCBI. For watercolor artists, I think a slightly bigger impact that at least I think about rather than my own personal health is the impact that it might have on the environment through our disposal of our paint water. While cobalt is a trace element that is found all throughout nature, excessive amounts in food or water sources can cause toxic effects in animals and their habitats. I have heard many people aggressively defend the use of toxic pigment, saying that the amount that we use as artists is completely negligible and we shouldn't even think about this uh, topic or talk about it at all. But I, for one, as an environmental educator, believe that everything that we do makes an impact. And if I can reduce my contributions to accumulative pollution in even just a tiny way, I personally would like to do that. So you don't have to agree with me, and I certainly encourage you all to do your own research on it, but that is just my two cents on the matter. I do like to find alternatives when I can. For example, with the cobalt blue, I have zero problem replacing it with ultramarine as I feel that the two colors are incredibly comparable, and I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything by not having it. However, I completely caved when it comes to cobalt teal as, as it is such a unique and irreplaceable blue. I didn't have it on my palette for the longest time, but as soon as I tried it, I fell in love. I adore it, I adore its mixtures, and the trade-off is that I just try and be extra careful when I'm disposing of my paint waste. I still don't use a whole lot of it since I don't paint a lot of blue things, but I do like knowing that it's there if I need it. So let me know in the comments below, do you use cobalt teal? And do you find it as invaluable of a paint color as I do? So in conclusion for today, I am sorry that I have kept you waiting for this episode a little bit longer than I would have liked to, but I greatly appreciate your support and understanding of the medical situation that I had last week and granting me the extra time to step back and take care of myself. 
Next week on May 10th, we're going to be releasing a new round of videos for the Animal Artists Collective. And as a double whammy, I'm going to be traveling next weekend as well. So I won't have a new color spotlight episode on that Friday, but I will have one the following week on May 18th. I will see you in other videos between now and then though, and I'm very much looking forward to doing so. Before you go, do let me know what you think about this little viper corn and let me know what you think his magical powers would be. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please consider giving this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed the content. Subscribe and hit the little bell if you'd like to join us again for the next one. And an extra special thank you to all of my amazing patrons for helping make this video possible. I will see you all in the next video and until then, happy painting.